Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and through our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, fellow redeemed. The gospel lesson will be the basis of my sermon this morning, and uh, it has as its theme, Jesus comes to Thomas. It's hard to imagine the roller coaster ride that the emotions of those first disciples must have experienced following the crucifixion. Now we find them in the gospel lesson, John, and the picture John paints for us, all huddled together behind locked doors for fear that the enemies of Jesus are coming after them next. It's the evening of that Easter day when Jesus rose from the dead. The mood of the disciples had to be one of sadness coupled with fear. Suddenly the risen Lord is in their midst, and their mood goes from the depths of gloom to the heights of exhilaration. Lord, you're alive. You're back here with us again. Now on this occasion, there were only ten of them. Judas Iscariot, the betrayer, is no longer with them. And for some unknown reason, Thomas is missing. Jesus greets them. Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Those words seem timely not only because of Easter, but they also seem timely because of what some families are preparing for in the weeks ahead as students are preparing to graduate. This is really a kind of a commencement address by Jesus to those disciples, those students of his, who he now declares to be sent out ones, which is what the meaning of the word apostle is. Their mission, announce forgiveness of sins to the whole world, to penitent believers, to equip them for their task, he breathes into them the Holy Spirit to ensure that their actions are both God-inspired and God-empowered. They are now the body of Christ, continuing the work of Christ with the mind and spirit of Christ dwelling within them, assuring them that what they forgive on earth will be forgiven in heaven. When this commencement exercise is over, just as quickly as he arrived, the master departs. John's Gospel tells us that it was a week later that Thomas has now rejoined the group to hear their excited claim. We have seen the Lord. Rather than share in the, their elation, Thomas kind of digs in his heels a little bit. Unless I see some evidence, I can't get that Good Friday scene out of my mind. There's no way he could be alive after what I saw on Friday. I'm simply not going to be able to believe it. Now, any normal teacher or master of such a recalcitrant student would simply dismiss Thomas, giving him an F for the course. Obviously, he does not deserve to be an apostle. But fortunately, for Thomas' sake and ours, Jesus is not a common, ordinary teacher or master. This teacher treasures every student, even those who don't believe in him at first. This teacher practices what he preaches. This teacher offered a very valuable lesson in the form of a parable recorded in Luke's Gospel, chapter 15, the so-called so lost and found chapter of Scripture. This teacher told the story of a shepherd, a shepherd who had a flock of 100 sheep, but one of them turns up missing. And what does he do? According to this teacher, he leaves the 99 and goes in search of the one who is lost and isn't satisfied until he's found it. 
Thus this teacher, who told that parable, is now doing that very thing. As he goes back to that same room a week later and seeks out and searches for Thomas. He goes up to the disciple, the disbelieving disciple, and says, Thomas, it's time for show and tell. Put your finger into my hand. See the mark of the nails? Stretch forth your hand and put it into my side. You see the mark of the spear? Stop doubting and believe. With tears of repentance mixed with indescribable joy, Thomas falls to his knees at the feet of his master and says, My Lord and my God. This is perhaps the most profound and powerful profession of faith in all of Scripture. Thomas's creed, you might call it, my Lord and my God. Those five words declaring, you are the Almighty, no question about it. And you love me beyond description, no doubt about it. And therefore, you are mine. I belong to you forever. This sermon theme, as I mentioned before, is Jesus comes to Thomas. However, that theme really doesn't tell the whole story. What follows, follows Thomas's confession of faith, my Lord and my God, tells the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey used to say. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. How many times when you've been listening to a sermon has the preacher stopped to give you a test, a quick exam, a quick question? Let's see what kind of listeners you really are. It's a little contest, a little riddle, supposedly. Um, I want to see how closely you listen to verse 29. I'll read it once again. Then Jesus told Thomas, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. What's the missing word? Do you know it? Did you catch it? Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. The missing word is the pronoun me, where Jesus refers simply to himself. What's the point of all of this? Well, you know, the ancient rabbis had a saying about the Jewish people and a part of their history. This rabbi who lived in 250 A.D., looked back on that Exodus experience and the Mount Sinai experience where the law, the Torah, was received from Mount Sinai. And this rabbi concluded, he said, you know, those people at the foot of the mountain were truly blessed to see the thunder and hear the thunder and, and see the lightning and all the display and, and the glow in Moses' face as he came down from the mountain with the tablets of stone. Then the rabbi went on to say, but you know something? The, one who God, the ones who God really favors are the ones who cause that Torah and that law of God to live in their hearts and lives without the privilege of having been at the foot of the mountain. Later generations. And that seems to be the point that Jesus is making when he says to Thomas, because you've seen me, now you're a believer. Blessed are those. My favor especially rests on those who have not seen and yet have come to faith. We heard it in the epistle lesson for today. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not now see him, 
you believe in him and are filled with inexpressible and glorious joy for you are receiving the goal of your faith the salvation of your souls so as we ponder our Lord's search and seizure of the heart and soul of Thomas we have to think about our own journey of faith your coming to faith is no less miraculous then this story of Jesus comes to Thomas. It'd be kind of fun right now to stop the sermon and say, okay, let's form a big circle. And everybody sit around in this circle, and we each share with one another the various things that happened in our lives to bring us to faith and to keep us in the faith. Of course, that's more than you bargained for when you got up this morning to come to church. Because that would take the rest of the afternoon and much of the evening hours before you'd be able to go home again. Because the stories would be rich in content and fascinating. Because the Lord works in each of our ways in, in a different way, in a different manner. He doesn't just stamp us out like a rubber stamp on the assembly line. He works and meets us wherever we're at, whatever our needs might be. And there he convicts us and leads us by the power of the Holy Spirit to believe and to rejoice. The point I'm simply trying to make here is that you're coming to faith in Jesus as the Son of God and your personal Savior from sin and the Lord of your life is not your doing, it's God's. For by grace are you saved through faith and not, not of yourselves, but it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone be tempted to boast. Dr. Martin Luther says it so well in his small catechism. I believe that I cannot, by my own reason or strength, believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him. But the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified and kept me in the one true faith. In the same way, he calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth and keeps it with Jesus Christ in the one true faith, in which Christian church he daily and richly forgives all sins to me and all believers, and will at the last day raise up me and all the dead and give unto me and all believers in Christ eternal life. This is most certainly true. When Jesus came to unbelieving Thomas, he allowed this wayward disciple to touch and see in order to bring him to faith. That hasn't happened to us, or has it? Fifty years ago, when I became a pastor, an incident happened in my first parish that I shall never forget. Fresh out of the seminary, my wife and I were sent to Trinity Lutheran Church in Macomb, Mississippi. I thought my learning days were over. They were just beginning. If any of you know your history pretty well, you know that Macomb, Mississippi, South Central Mississippi in 1966 was a learning experience. Let me tell you, there are not too many Lutherans in them that are hills. Our tiny congregation numbered 21 members. And that's counting adults and children. Well, you can imagine how thrilled we were when shortly after my arrival, a new Lutheran family moved into Brookhaven, Mississippi, which was 25 miles north of ours, and joined our congregation. Now, don't suspect that there were other congregations closer by that were Lutheran. Ours was the only Lutheran church for 70 miles in any direction. So you were kind of stuck with us. This family joined us. It was a family of five, a husband and wife, and two grown children, and the elderly father of the husband who made his home with them. They were regular in worship, which we were thankful for, except the elderly father or grandfather. He had health issues which kept him from leaving the home. So, as a result of that, it's not uncommon for pastors to make house calls and shut-in calls 
I would call on him regularly at their home with devotions and Holy Communion. The husband frequently traveled for extended periods in connection with his work. And it so happened that one time when he was out of town on a business trip, his elderly father suffered a severe stroke and very suddenly died. We were all shocked by this turn of events. In a conversation sometime later, I happened to mention to Al, the, father, or the son of this father who died, that my last visit with his father happened the day before his death and included Holy Communion. It was just a comment in passing on my part, but I'll never forget this man's reaction. His anxious face sort of relaxed into a peaceful smile. And then he said, I'm so glad to hear that Dad was in touch just before he died. In touch. What a beautiful description of the sacraments. Holy baptism and its use of water, a common, precious element, particularly in an arid region of the country as we live in, which touches both our insides and our outside with its refreshing qualities. Every time we come into contact with water, it can serve to remind us of the fact that through holy baptism, we have been washed clean from sin and merged with Christ forever. And then there's Holy Communion where we receive in, with, and under the bread and wine nothing less than the very body and blood of Christ, our Savior, given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do you know what the ancient Romans, the Roman Christians, called Holy Communion in their Latin language? Viaticum. That's spelled V-I-A-T-I-C. U-M, viaticum. If any of you are students of Latin, you know that what that means when you translate it literally is something for the way or food for the journey. What a beautiful description of the Lord's Supper, which keeps us in touch with Christ and nourishes our faith. Truly it is food or the journey. So you see, Thomas isn't the only one to have his faith established and strengthened by a touch and see experience. We touch and see the presence of Christ every time we come forward in response to that invitation, take, eat, this is my body, given and broken for you. Take and drink, this is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, shed for the forgiveness of your sins. And finally, just as the resurrected Jesus greeted those early disciples with the words, peace be with you, so we conclude our celebrations of his resurrection with the words, and now depart in peace. Amen. May the God of peace who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us rise and join in the words of the Apostles' Creed. A few more words than Thomas's creed, but no less true. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. 
He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.